Welcome to Cambridge Muslim College. Uh, my name is Davina, I'm the Head of Development here. Um, the college has been around, most of you probably know, for about a decade. And um, we have several programs that are on site, but we also have a growing uh, sort of body of online programs. And really it's thanks to our supporters um, over the years who've enabled us to sort of host uh, events like this. And we have much more in the pipeline. Specifically, um, we, we have a large donor community as well. So if you would like to become a friend or a patron, uh, we have a retreat coming up in December in Cambridge um, that we're organizing so come up to me or any volunteers uh, to ask any questions on behalf of Cambridge Muslim College I am delighted to welcome award-winning novelist Leila Abu Layla to the college to kickstart our first event of our tea over book series so when I first picked up one of Leila's books admittedly I was a little nervous about how Muslims and Islam would be depicted in books that have achieved mainstream recognition and I was pleasantly surprised and actually quite relieved uh, to find in my reading Muslim characters and the Islamic faith represented in a way that was both nuanced and multidimensional. And indeed, Layla's work has received critical recognition and a high profile for its depiction of the interior lives of Muslim women and its distinctive exploration of migration and Islamic spirituality. She's the author of five novels, Bird Summons, Minaret, The Translator, which was a New York Times 100 Ball Notable Books of the Year, The Kindness of Enemies, and Lyrics Alley, which won her the fiction winner of the Scottish Book Awards. Layla was the first winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing, and her latest story collection, Elsewhere Home, won the Saltire Fiction Book of the Year Award, which is one of the most prestigious uh, writing awards in Scotland. Her work has been translated into 15 languages, and she was long listed three times for the Orange Prize, which is now known as the Women's Prize for Fiction. Leila was born in Cairo, grew up in Sudan, and moved in her mid-twenties to Scotland. Her sixth novel, River Spirit, is due for publication next year. So what most of uh, Leila's biographies actually omit is that Leila is a statistician, so <laughs> she has a master's in statistics from the LSE, is that correct? Yes, which is a bit of a plot twist. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here because I'm a big fan of the Cambridge Muslim College and I follow you on social media. And I spent the Ramadan lockdown watching all the videos. So that was really nice. And all the videos are there, so check them out. You know, you've received many mainstream accolades, as we've heard from the bio. Um, and your work has actually even caught the attention of, of many writers like Ali Smith, um, Nobel uh, w w uh, Prize winner, uh, John Curtsy, um, you know, who've really praised your work. So were you surprised at your success? Did that kind of come all at once with the, with the publication of Translator or did it grow? And especially in an industry where there perhaps wasn't traditionally a lot of space for someone who is Muslim, openly Muslim, Sudanese, African, Arab, how have you navigated that journey? Well, um, I was encouraged by um, uh, the Scottish writers who themselves see themselves as being marginalised and they're not really part of the London elite. You know, they're not, um, you know, the usual uh, writers who are, you know, ha are living in London. And, and so they see themselves also as outsiders. And this was the time when I first started writing, this was the time when train spotting became a hit. And, and even though that's so different than what I write, but just the, the, the idea that, that an outsider could come in uh, encouraged me and made me think, oh, well, you know, there could be space then for, you know, for the immigrant, for the Muslim, for the Sudanese to be um, reflected in English um, uh, contemporary literature. So I was quite confident I wasn't, uh, I'm supposed to say I'm surprised and everything, but, but writers have huge egos. So every time <laughs> people say to them, your writing is good, they're like, well, you know, of course. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a, um, you have to be sort of really confident in, your, in yourself. Otherwise, how are you going to do it? How are you going to share, share with, 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 uh, with, with other people? So there is a combination of, 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 of confidence and then at the same time, you know, deep anxiety that, it's, uh, that it, there is no market for your work, that people don't like it, that you're not good enough. So it's a kind of a combination of, of, of the two. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll pick up um, on that later in okay. terms of like, you know, how you found that confidence, whether people encouraged you, maybe in your personal life and so forth. Yes. But I'd like to go now to uh, your books uh, themselves sure. and um, delve into really uh, a central theme in, in a lot of your work, which is faith and spirituality. 
um, you know, you unapologetically, though not, not in an apologetic way, put faith sort of front and center in a lot of your work. And there are Muslim characters of, of all hues, uh, you know, those who are struggling with their faith, those who found faith, those who move to a different country and have to kind of grapple with what it means to be a Muslim, those who are mixed race. Uh, so what are you trying to achieve when you weave uh, faith and spirituality in your work? And especially when so many of your passages go in depth about sort of certain Muslim acts of you know, worship and rituals, um, what, what are you sort of hoping to, to you know, gain by doing that? Well, I'm hoping to put Islam in English uh, literature because, um, uh, well, two things. First of all, um, as I was growing up, uh, in, and like any other African or Asian uh, child reading English, you s you're aware then that this is a European culture. You notice that you're reading about strawberries or you're reading about Christmas or reading about things that have nothing to do with your day-to-day -day life as a, as a child. Um, so that was all there for me. But in addition to that, I picked up on, on the, the, the absence of Islam. I was always reading... Um, I mean, if I read, for example, that um, in a family they have a Bible and then they have the name of their grandfather written on the Bible, I'm like, oh, that's really strange because in the, uh, you know, we have copies of the Quran at home and nobody ever would write their name on it. So I was always sort of aware of, of these kind of differences. Um, you know, you read Jane Austen and you think about all these the inheritance laws and you think, wow, that's so weird, f you know, from an Islamic perspective. Um, you read Jane Eyre and you think, oh, this poor man, you know, he can't get a divorce, he can't have a second wife, and he's stuck to this ill lady. So, so that was I was always reading from uh, from that respect, uh, Rat's perspective, and I didn't really share it with ev with anyone around me. It was just how I read. So I w I was aware of, of of a kind of an this absence. So when I came to writing, uh, that's what I wanted to put, you know, because you have to, you have to put something that's missing. You have to add something. Um, you know, what, what are you bringing new? Uh, everybody, a lot of people are writing. There's lots of wonderful books out there. Why should you add something unless you're really adding something? So this is what I wanted to add. So that's part of the, 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 the thing. The other part is that I grew up in a very liberal atmosphere in, in, in Khartoum. I was, my family were not particularly religious. I didn't wear hijab. I, you know, I, I, I mixed with people of all faith. I went to a, um, a Catholic girls' school uh, in which the majority of the students were Muslim. But it, I mean, that it was still... Um, you know, a Catholic school. So, but then when I came here, when I immigrated, the, I felt an absence of faith. I, it just struck me as being so, that it wasn't there. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't hear the Azan. I found it hard uh, not to say inshallah every time about things that are happening in the future. I, um, I was anxious about my children. I, um, um, even though the, 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 the Muslims I grew up with in Sudan were very liberal and very relaxed and, uh, and didn't practice and you know, did haram stuff, but they never actually said they didn't believe. They never went that far. But to have that said here and to have that said as being normal, and it's not only normal, it's actually, if you don't say that, then you're the weirdo or you're the... The, the 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 kind of idiot or something it was was hugely shocking for me hugely shocking and 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 so that brought on this desire to express that shock in in the fiction yeah so when you mention the absence of faith that's not just the absence of islam but actually the absence of faith altogether yes altogether because i grew up surrounded by christians as i said i was in a catholic school so i had christian friends and they they worshiped they believed you know um, um, I didn't feel so. So yeah, the, the Christians here were not like the the Christians I I knew. There were um, a lot of Coptic. A lot of Sudanese are um, are Coptic, and uh, a lot of South Sudanese are are Christian. 
And I really see that exploration of faith actually in your most recent book, uh, Bird Summons, which was published a few years ago, is yeah. that correct? Um, it's a story, if you haven't read it, of, uh, that follows three Muslim women of Arab origin, and they embark on a road trip to uh, visit the grave of Lady Zainab Cobbled. And let's just say that things unravel very quickly, <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. But certainly in the book, what is apparent is that um, they each have a different relationship with their faith and go through a sort of metamorphosis, uh, but also Christianity, and especially sort of Christianity that was practiced in that land, in Scotland, um, is very much highlighted and almost juxtaposed against um, these three Muslim women. And there's a monastery that features often in the setting. So what are you uh, trying to do there with that kind of contrast? And is that sort of related to what you were saying? Yeah, because then if you go back in time, you see that that, that people here used to be uh, believers uh, and that they lived actually very, they lived, they had Muslim lifestyles, if you want to call it that. So whenever I visit all these historical places, and I was quite fond, fond of doing that, I think of that, I think of them, I feel kind of connected to them. I mean, I used to love reading historical fiction, and, and, and I, nowadays I don't because they take all the faith out of it, which is, which is not even realistic. But, but the, the modern day writers are not able to, to put that in, they just don't have the, 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 the education or the, or the knowledge. But um, yes, if you go back in time, then, 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 then people were believers. And actually, if you read 19th century um, novels, um, they're infu infused with a lot of Christianity. I mean, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, they were very, very strong Christians. Uh, Charlotte Bronte, we, Jane Eyre is a very Christian book, so the, one of the most Christian books ever. And she was the daughter of a vicar, and you know, she married also um, a, a priest, I think, or, 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 a, or a vicar. So uh, the, 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 the English literature is very, um, uh, is deeply Christian. Even though nowadays people would say it's secular, yes, it's becoming more secular, but there, there's still they've, some elements are kept, you know, in the gothic, in the horror stories, and in the fantasy. There's a lot of um, um, influence of Christianity that, that that is still there, and so as a Muslim coming into it, you 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 you're aware of that. It just it just it's. It, it, you know, it's it's quite obvious for me that 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 that, that, that all these things—science fiction, fantasy, uh, the whole of the Western canon—and what is still being produced is still influenced by that. But that originally people did did believe and that they did uh, worship. Yeah. That reminds me of uh, something I heard a Muslim scholar say once, which is, I think a Muslim parent asked him, what should I encourage my children to read? And he said, read the classics, mm. read Jane Eyre, read Jane Austen, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Charles Dickens, because you know, I suppose it's more appropriate, uh, maybe for Muslim teenagers and children, but also it's those, those morals and themes that you were talking about and the, the portrayal of Christianity. Um, so actually, may I invite you to read from some of your books? Because um, we've been talking a lot sort of theoretically, but it'd be really lovely to actually hear the voices uh, from these uh, this work. Okay, so I'm going to read um, um, the paragraphs about prayer um, from four different um, books. And so this is uh, starting off with uh, Lyrics Alley, and this is um, it's a novel set in Sudan in the 1950s, and this is um, um, from the perspective of an Egyptian teacher. Um, the men lined up in the garden on King Street, near the building site of the Farouk Mosque. Badr liked praying in Sudan. There was something spacious and welcoming about these prayers in the open air, and it seemed to him as if they accommodated more of Allah's creatures. This feeling, when he first arrived in Sudan, had seemed to him fanciful, but he had grown used to it and accepted it. As a child in his village of Kafr dawar he had been terrified of the ghouls and jinns that inhabited the darkness of alleyways and the most deserted of fields. This fear had turned to caution when he was older, and whenever circumstances compelled him to take these haunted routes, he would arm himself with verses of the Qur'an and hurry to his destination. In Sudan, though, he had come to experience more benign spirits. Today, as he walked forward to pray in the front row, his wet bare feet treading grass, he sensed the congregation swelling with invisible worshippers. So palatable was their presence 
that it was as if the barrier separating the world from that of mankind had thinned and become transparent. Were they angels, robust and pure, better than him, because they never despaired and never tired? Badr felt himself slide into another dimension. It was unexpected and unasked for, a dip into an alternative state, where he was weightless and free, and his concerns, valid and pressing only minutes ago, slackened and moved away. They did not disappear, but receded to the back of his mind, as if they were taking a rest. The imam, in his recitation, stumbled over a verse, and Badr, standing right behind him, prompted the correct words. This gladdened him. He had made sure that Allah's words were recited in the correct manner, order. He was a teacher, after all, and his role was to demonstrate and correct. He felt himself elevated, his presence appreciated by all who were present, men, angels, and jinn. So the next um, section is going to be from um, my book of short stories. This is um, called Elsewhere Home. It's a collection of short stories. And this is one of the, the stories I, um, I wrote early on when I first came from, from Sudan. And it's about um, a wife in London, um, who uh, a young wife, Sudanese wife, who misses Sudan. And so she's remembering... Uh, her time in University of Khartoum, and she's remembering one of her colleagues who she used to nickname the ostrich. And then there's a re reference here in this piece to her, her husband as well, um, who uh, she's feeling a bit, you know, um, kind of distant from. They're having problems. The sunset prayers were a break in the middle of these evening lectures. One communist lecturer keen to assert his atheism ignored the rustling of the notebooks, the shuffling of restless feet, the screech of the ostrich's alarm. Only when someone called out a break for the prayers did he stop teaching. I will always see the grass, patches of dry yellow, the rugs of palm fiber laid out. They curl at the edges, and when I put my forehead on the ground, I can smell the grass underneath. Now that we have a break, we must hurry, for it is as if the birds have heard the azan and started to pray before us. I can hear their praises, see the branches bow down low to receive them as they dart to the trees. We wash from a corner tap, taking turns. The ostrich squats and puts his whole head under the tap. He shakes it backwards and drops of water balance on top of his hair. I borrow a mug from the canteen and I am proud a little vain knowing that I can wash my hands, face, arms, and feet with only one mug. Sandals discarded, we line up and the boy from the canteen joins us, his torn clothes stained with tea. Another lecturer, not finding room on the mat, spreads his handkerchief on the grass. If I was not praying, I would stand with my feet crunching the gravel stones and watch the straight lines, the men in front, the colorful toes behind, I would know that I was part of this harmony, that I needed no permission to belong. Here in London, the birds pray discreetly and I pray alone. A printed booklet, not a muazzin, tells me the time. Here in London, Majdi does not pray. This country, he says, chips away at your faith bit by bit. So now we have um, the translator, which is my first uh, novel. And um, we had mentioned Jane Eyre, and, and, and when I wrote the translator, I was um, uh, thinking, uh, feeling I was writing a, um, a Muslim Jane Eyre. Because in, in Jane Eyre, as we said, Mr. Rochester um, can't marry Jane because he's already married to Bertha. So there's a very sort of like a, um, a Christian reason for, for, for stop, there's a Christian reason stopping the, the lovers coming together. And, um, and so in, in the translator, I've got that this, that this Sudanese uh, woman uh, falls in love with a Scottish um, uh, academic and um, who's, not a, who's not a Muslim. So this is the, 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 the issue in the, in the novel. And so you're meant to read and think, is he going to convert or isn't he? Is he? Isn't he? Okay. <laughs> so this is uh, when she's at work. She works as a translator, and hence the 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 the, the name of the uh, of the of the novel. 
In the afternoon, she went to pray in the small university mosque, a room given over to the Muslim students. It was in another building, older and more beautiful than the modern building where her own department was. She found the room dark and empty. She switched on the lights, took off her shoes, and felt eerily alone in the spacious room with its high ceiling. When it was crowded during turn time, everyone just prayed on the carpet, but now she took one of the mats that was folded on a shelf and spread it out. It was blue, plusher than the one she had at home and with a picture of the Kaaba under a navy sky. There was more reward praying in a group than praying alone. When she prayed with others, she found it easier to concentrate. To concentrate, Her heart held steady by those who had faith like her. Now she stood alone under the high ceiling of the ancient college, began to say silently, All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the compassionate, the merciful. And the certainty of the words brought unexpected tears, something deeper than happiness, all the splinters inside her coming together. And then the very last is bird summons, which, is, which you mentioned about the ladies going on, um, on a trip to the highlands. So this is uh, one of them. Um, so this is out in the highlands. She kept walking, and the more, she, the more she walked, the healthier and stronger she felt. Too warm now for a jacket, she took it off and tied it around her waist. She walked towards the sound of running water, and when she reached the stream, she washed her face, and then on the spur of the moment, decided to take off her shoes and socks, make wudu and pray. The grass was her prayer mat, the wind a protector. Her knees felt grounded to this particular piece of earth. She spoke to it and said, Bear witness for me, on the day I will need you to, on the day you will be able to speak and I will not. Say that I prayed here in this very spot and nowhere else. The sound of her voice, urgent and pleading, made her smile. She was acting out of character. Usually when it came to matters of faith, she was pragmatic and mild. But this place was something else. That's it. Thank you so much for that. I think you've lulled us into a very uh, peaceful state. What I've uh, picked up from just those readings is how faith, um, at least in those passages, are a sort of positive force, um, you know, helping these characters deal with alienation or difficulties, as it often is for a lot of our lives. When you read out these passages, perhaps uh, pas passages to a non-Muslim um, audience, um, especially you know those who don't often encounter descriptions of faith and acts of worship in what they read, just like you mentioned, it's quite absent in a lot of our, our novels. What is the reaction that you get? Well, they 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 accept it. I mean, they 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 take it. Um, they're not. Um, it's it doesn't. Um, I mean, it's it's it it's, it doesn't really upset them or disturb them. I, I I don't think so. No, no, yeah. And in terms of uh, your own kind of uh, journey, because you know, like some of these characters, you move you move from a different country. You came to a country that sort of is non-Muslim. Um, have your sort of experiences of doing research for these books and writing um, this rich tapestry of, of characters impacted your own relationship with faith and how you see, you know, being a Muslim here and just generally, you know, your, your relationship with religion? Um, that's a difficult question to answer because uh, the world is changing also as I write and, uh, and I'm also growing up, you know, and, and, and changing. So it's difficult really to know where, how the write, how writing something then impacts me. Um, I suppose it, it connects me with people. It makes me feel that that I ha that that you know I've I, I I have a connection with with readers, which is which is a positive thing. Um, I find I found that throughout my books, the 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 themes I get the, the or the spiritual themes are getting more complex. So, like for example, I started with a translator, and this, as I said, this this widow was in love with this man who's not a Muslim, and so this is someone who wants something that that they can't can't have, you know, in, in the Sharia. So it was a kind of a straightforward, um, uh, a simple, uh, let's say, let's say a simple spiritual problem. You want something, but 
you really shouldn't have it. And then I went on with the next novel, and it was Minaret, and this was a, a movement of, of a girl who's, you know, who comes from a very uh, secular background, and then she changes and she starts to wear hijab and she starts to learn about Islam. So it was kind of a, a kind of a more of a details uh, change. And then with Lyrics Ali, it was about um, how do we respond when when bad things happen to us? You know, when 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 life throws at us really difficult, uh, you know, bur burdens, and we have to be patient and read difficult trials. And then uh, with the, with the kindness of enemies, it was the the theme of jihad. And, and and that was also in Imam Shamil's life and all the struggles he went to. And then with Bird Summons, it was really also very complex, which about these women and their, you know, their 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 egos and uh, um, you know, getting inspiration from the the conference of the birds. And so I feel that I'm kind of like going more and more um getting more co complex, getting more deeper into these um, these sp spiritual uh, issues or challenges, you, you say, yeah. No, and it's I, I should also mention there is an element of magical realism in Bird Summons, which it's just a fascinating combination. You know, seeing Muslim characters having this. Well, maybe I shouldn't give away too much, <laughs> no, but but okay. certainly, you know, it's it's just really refreshing to read mm. that. So it seems like it's not only the complexity of spiritual topics, but also perhaps genres that you're you're experimenting with. Yeah, you kind of like feel more confident than to take more risks as you as you come along because you've 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 done it. And the book I just finished writing now, which is still not going to come out till next March, inshallah, it's called River Spirit. I found that very hard because it's uh, it's it's a conflict uh, between Muslims between Muslims themselves, and it's uh, about uh, the time in Sudan in the 19th century when a man declared himself to be the Mahdi. And people believed him, and they took up arms against the authorities. And uh, so you have then, when you're reading, you're reading about somebody who uh, is very religious, they're praying everything, but they're saying that they had a dream, and they're saying the prophet told me I'm the Mahdi, and they're saying that if you don't believe me, you're a kafir. And so that was very hard for me to go to do that and to to write about Muslims, um, you know, fighting against other Muslims. I found that the hardest to, to, to do. Yes, and something that I, I personally really appreciate is that, of course, Muslims are not homogenous. You know, there are people who pray, but they drink. You know, they, yes. they say they believe and they do really bad things, right? And so you can't paint them with, with sort of one brush. You mentioned Sudan, and Lyrics Ali specifically is set in Sudan in the 1950s, as you mentioned, and you mentioned that very turbulent time um, with, with that uh, man, uh, the Mahdi. And um, uh, when, you, when you sort of conceived of this novel, um, what was... Why did you want to write a book set in Sudan, especially for a Western audience? Was that something you had been wanting to do, or what were you trying to achieve with that? With Lyrics Alley? Yes. Well, it's based on a story of my father's cousin, so it was very much a story of a family story. It was, um, I was writing it during the last years of my father's life, so in a way I was he was talking about his youth and I was, you know, absorbing all of that and, and kind of writing it um, uh, for him because feeling that the time was running out and that his memories also were, were, you know, were of a time that has long gone. So it's very personal. I think the thing with writers, especially my kind of writing, the fiction writing, is that we use our life, we use what we know as material. So we're restricted to some extent. I mean, surely we can imagine but um, you're still, you know, using what you what you know already, what you've experienced uh, already. Um, so it's not really. Sometimes it's not really a choice as much as well. That's what I can do. Yeah. No, that's right. And actually, I did want to touch upon the craft of writing as well because it's, it's an art form. And you, so you mentioned, you know, you draw on your personal experiences. Is it? A little bit scary. I mean, you mentioned confidence as well, but is it a, a slightly fr frightening to put a bit of yourself in your books or a bit of your family history or background and have the world sort of read it and evaluate it? For me, it's not. But people are different. I mean, people differ in how in their privacy. People, you know, some people don't 
don't feel comfortable sharing or um, um, you know putting into words their feelings or their anxieties and 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 so I noticed this about fiction writers that we tend to be quite open. We tend to be we don't mind, and then we reach a, a stage where, as you said, you mentioned the craft where we care more about the story than what people think about us personally, which is kind of dangerous. <laughs> but 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 it's it's in a way it's, it's it's this is where the craft comes in that the story is more important. So the story then becomes more important than um, you know than what people are going to think about you or what uh, uh, how good you're going to look or you know th this kind of thing you you're then caring more about the the story to make it a good story yeah but do you not feel pressure at times you've been described as you know a muslim writer an arab writer an african writer a diasporic female uh, writers when I came across. Uh, do you feel that because maybe a, a lot of maybe people from these backgrounds in the West aren't represented or misrepresented, that you have to portray them or you feel a pressure to portray them in a particular right, uh, light and write about them in a certain way? No, because I'm, I want to write, there's an urgency, you know, I'm just, if, I'm just wanting, all these words are, words are bristling in my head, I want to get them out. So it's not, it's not as if I'm sitting there quietly and then people are asking me, well, present this or present that. It's me wanting to say, you know, having all this stuff that I want to say. So um, I don't feel this pressure. But also another thing that needs to be said, my readership is quite um, uh, niche, you know, it's, it's not you know hundreds of thousands so so i'm lucky in a way i think the problem happens when writers uh, when when uh, when books become best sellers and then everybody reads them and they fall in the wrong hands and they people pick them up out just out of curiosity and that's when then you get a lot of uh, negative feedback that's when you get a lot of pressure because suddenly it's become uh, it's, it's just become a product that has just gone uh, you know, far, far and, and wide. In my case, I'm still, uh, you know, everybody who picks up my book, most, the majority, 99% are symp sympathetic to Muslims, even if they're not Muslims them, themselves. So that's, I think that that is, is really important to say because all these controversies that we hear about and uh, the problems we hear about always affect the, the best-selling books. They don't affect the, 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 the books with the moderate um, you know, audience. Yeah. But isn't it in a way an aspiration for, for a lot of authors to want to really get a, as wide a readership as possible? I mean, is that actually you're quite content with where things are at in your career and you, you enjoy having this connection with your more niche audience? Well, of course, you do want to reach more more people, even within the the the, the niche. You think mm, that niche can get bigger, or of course, if, you know, the part of being a writer is having this ambitious ambition to want. To, but I comfort myself, telling myself that I'll get into trouble if it. <laughs> so I'm actually saying what I say to myself. <laughs> Well, talking about getting into trouble, uh, I think it was the uh, uh, author Kazuo Ishiguro last year, he said that he was fearful for the younger generation of authors that, you know, there is more pressure and more criticism, maybe because we live in an age of internet trolling and social media. You published your first book before all of that. And have you personally witnessed um, more backlash? I mean, I think you, you seem to indicate no, but do you share his concern? And what advice would you give to sort of young writers, maybe from a similar background to, to, to you? No, I think this is just something that people like to talk about, like to chat about. I think it's not, uh, I think people's tastes change over time. And so things that were appropriate at one time are not appropriate at another time. I mean, we, we someone my age, we grew up reading Enid Blyton and she had gollywogs and she had things like that. And these things aren't there anymore. It's nothing to, it's not really about freedom. It's just about it's changes in, in attitudes and changes in, uh, in um, you know what used to be what people got away with at a certain time, fat shaming or something you can't do now. So it's, it's, these are just change, these are natural changes. It's, it's, it's not about uh, uh, so if you are alert to, to the world and alert to, to what people are saying and to alert of, to what's acceptable and not acceptable, then that will naturally come out in, in your writing. You're not self-censoring or, or, or anything. Um, I think the problem is the shrinking of the readers, that, that not many readers 
are actually reading fiction because of the the Netflix, the, the all the, the there's a huge competition from uh, you know from the the these shows and these uh, series. So the the readership is, is is shrinking. So I think that that is the challenge that 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 we are we're facing. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Actually, the medium of writing versus screen, images, television. Why do you think it's important that people and Muslims read and write? Like, what is the purpose of fiction to you? Well, I think in our case, in the case of Muslims in the West, fiction is a way of, 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 um, you know, of joining in, uh, of being part of, of of something that's very valued in in this society. I mean, there's still. Uh, even though the market is shrinking, the, still fiction is, is respected. This is the land of English literature. So when you are saying that you love English literature, when you're saying that I want to be part of it, when you're saying I'm adding to it, I'm bringing something new to it, then that's a good thing. You're 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 that's a, that's a good thing for for Muslims uh, to do. And we're we're we we are living here. We're part of the life here, and 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 we have new stories. You know, there's always a need for new stories. There's always a need for freshness or, or even old stories told in new ways and so we can contribute and we can bring in um, you know um, um, tales you know and, and from our own different cultures and and, and and so there's a lot there's a it's a field that's that's kind of like open f for us so I think that that is is a good thing going back to one of your books actually in terms of you know stories that maybe aren't being told or retold uh, so you mentioned earlier that in your book the kindness of enemies uh, you feature imam shamil who most of us probably know is a great spiritual military leader of the 19th century uh, in the caucasus what about him attracted you that you wanted to actually fictionalize his life because it was honestly again very unusual to see this great historical fiction of, of um, character being brought to life like that in, in your work yeah and this was a bit stretch, you know, writing about 19th century Russia and things like that. I was very moved by the story of Imam Shamil because he uh, he was a Muslim, obviously he was an imam and he was uh, fighting against Russian imperial invas um, invasion. And he, his son was taken away from him by the, 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 the Russians. They, it was, they kind of tricked him. And they took his son and he was eight years old and he became the godchild of um, the Tsar of Russia and he was brought up uh, in the court and he became, uh, you know, enrolled in the army. And so Imam Shamal was always trying to bring him back, to bring his, back, his son back. And to me, this idea of an Imam having his son lost like that, you know, gone over to the other side, it moved me terribly. And uh, it, in a way, um, like, we here in, 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 in the West, when we're bringing up our children, it's almost as if um, we're giving them up for adoption, almost, because the schools influence them, the society influences them. We're not really in control of everything that our children do, even though they're in our house. You know, and now the, the internet has entered as well. So it, it, it kind of resonated with me, this idea of, of, of the, the, the child being away that he didn't have control of his son, that he couldn't bring up his son as a Muslim, and how agonizing that must have been for him and humiliating. And all. So that kind of made me feel so uh, close to him, you know, and wanting to write about that. And so that was fueled the whole kind of uh, story and made me research and made me do the whole thing. So it's just this, this connection to him um, um, losing his son and wanting he didn't lose him forever because the, the child was there and he wanted to bring him back and it felt to me somehow like like this is how Muslims feel in the West when their children uh, sometimes um, move away from Islam or they are they're 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 they are uh, you know um, are are you know having problems with their children or, and, and all that so that was it and definitely there's, you know, these themes that you mentioned, I mean, for a Muslim, you know, going through maybe similar experiences to draw parallel with your books, that's a very positive influence potentially your books having on someone's life. Yet, there are certain opinions, Islamically, um, although there is a mixture of opinions that writing fiction is perhaps a bit frivolous and in a bit of a grey area in terms of permissibility. Is this something you've encountered and had to grapple with? Yes, this this did worry me because uh, um, 
it's lying, isn't it? You're lying. You're telling lies. Basically, you're not you're not being honest because you've written all these fiction. So in a way, you're you're no longer a reliable person. And I always wondered that what what struck me was like, would I in an Islamic environment, in an Islamic court, would I would my with any statement I give as a witness, will it be countered or will someone say, oh no, she's a fiction writer, she made this up? And, and I think, well, that's actually quite fair because uh, I could make stuff up. I, I, I have done that before, I could make stuff up. So in a way, it's, it's, it's because it's so important in, in Islam to say the truth and to be honest. And this is really, you're entering a, an area which is kind of messy and kind of it's also involves people's lives and sometimes you're depicting things which are not islamic and and you have to pitch it in a way so that you're not glamorizing um sin or you're not you know it's 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 this really very very tricky but as with um dramas and and tv i mean the 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 the, the fatwa which i read which the azhar issued is that these things are to, they're not a blanket yes or no it's 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 how what your intention is. It's the intention behind it, and what and how you're depicting these issues, and 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 you know, and what it, what the message you're giving, and 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 on all of that. It's not a it's not a, a, a clear cut case of that. You know, all fiction is is wrong, or all films are are all dramas are, are are wrong. Yeah. So you found a way to sort of reconcile it, and it's probably influenced how you think about. Writing. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm sure there are questions from the audience and I'll give people a chance to ask questions too. Final question, if there was only one book that you could choose that um, the future generations can read, only one, which one of your books would that be and why? Oh, um, it would probably be um, a kind of a, either the, the lyrics arc or translator. Maybe. Only choose one. I could only choose one. Um, maybe Lyrics Alley. Why Lyrics Alley? It feels. Um, I think it's it's it might be my best in technically. Uh, also, um, it's very close to to my heart because it's about Sudan. It's set in Sudan. Uh, it doesn't have the it doesn't have the tension of the Islam in the West theme. And, and so um, it, it doesn't have that tension in it. But that tension, as you said, generations to come, maybe inshallah and generations to come, being a Muslim in the, in the West will be just a normal thing. And so uh, people will read my novels as, oh, it used to be tough back in the day. <laughs> Inshallah. As a sort of mirror into history, yes, that's yeah. interesting. Well, thank you so much. No, I think no. um, you know, I'm sure all of you agree that this has been really insightful and fascinating. Thank you. I think we'll end on that note. Can you join me in a round of applause for Layla? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us today. Layla will be signing some books if you wish, and I believe some of her books are on sale. Now we are going to be split into groups and um, there'll be reading rooms dotted around the college where you can just um, enjoy a cup of tea and pick up a book and read it. If you wish to buy lunch and come back, you're very much welcome to. Thank you all for coming and um, we hope to welcome you back soon. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. That was so special. Thank you. Thank you. That was really special. Thank you.